From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Jim Paris at Worldwide Mutual. Don't tell me, Jim. Let me guess. Huh? What are you talking about? The reason you call me, I can smell the smoke all the way over here at my apartment. Oh, Also, well. I heard something about the fire on a news broadcast a few minutes ago. Yes. Somewhere out on Albany Avenue, he said. Yes, it's the cash and save market over the other side of town. And since your company insured it, you want me to go over and take a look? A good look, Johnny. You thinking of possible arson? I am. Okay, why? That store is just one of a chain. Hartford, Boston, Providence, Springfield, Lowell. Yeah, yeah, I see. But how does that make it arson? This is the fourth one to go up in as many weeks. Oh. The outfit that owns them having financial troubles? The outfit that owns them is one man. Oh. John Wakefield Carson. Then I repeat my question. Johnny, if he is burning up his own markets, if you can prove it, you can save our company a lot of money. That might cost you a lot of money, Jim. What do you mean? Wait till you see my expense account. <laughs> Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Carson arson matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and a quarter for a taxi from my apartment to the offices of Worldwide, where I hoped Jim Paris could give me a little more to go on. He did. Very little. First loss four and a half weeks ago was the market up in Thompsonville. How much? Loss in Thompsonville, $41,204. That was the smallest one in the chain. Uh huh. The following week, the one over in Fall River burned to the ground. And the claim on that? Uh, some $58,000 odd dollars. Nothing odd about that much, though. And the loss in Lowell was a bit over $64,000. How much the claim will be on this one here in Hartford remains to be seen. How much coverage does he have on it? Around 100000 I believe. Yes, 106000 Well, then that's probably what he's going to claim. Look, you can still see the smoke out there. Yes, and the telephone report I just got says it looks like a total loss. Will you go over and take a look at it? John Wakefield Carson. That's right. His office is up in Boston. That's where his newest, biggest market is. Oh, how much insurance on that one? Nearly half a million. It's one of the largest, most modern then supermarkets. I'd better get over and see him in a hurry. Hmm? You want me to get there before that one goes up, don't you? Expense account item two, four fifty for a cab to the scene of the fire way out on Albany Road. Three or four fire companies were hard at it. But it was easy to see there wasn't a chance of saving much. It struck me that this location, part of a brand new residential area, was about as far from an established fire company as it could be. I wondered for a moment if this was deliberate. I finally ran down Hal Gibbons, an old pal, and one of the best men an arson squad ever had. Stick your nose up in the air and take a deep one, Johnny. You smell it? Well, it's not kerosene, Hal. I don't think it's gasoline, either. No, but it's something highly inflammable. The boys of that chemical truck could get it out. They might learn something. Of course, these stores always stock a lot of cleaning fluids, stuff like that. Most of them are not inflammable. Well, how about... Johnny, look out! Hey, maybe we'd better move back away. Yeah. Must have got a pretty big start on the fireman, Hal. Sure, because it's so far out. It's like the markets in Thompsonville and Fall River. And Lowell, too. Oh, kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? At this point, I'm more than just wondering, Johnny. Have you come up with anything? Those other towns are out of my bailiwick, but I know all the boys in the departments. Have they come up with anything? No, and that's why I feel I've got to get the first lead, if there is one, right here. Has old man Carson showed up? No, not during any of the fires. He just sits calmly in his office in Boston, mutters something philosophical about the vagaries of fortune, and lets it go at that. And files a big, fat insurance claim. I think I want to see that guy, Carson. I don't think it'll do you any good, but go to it. Know anything about his financial situation? He's loaded. Multimillionaire. And boy, what a queer one. What's that mean? A regular nut. 
Always quoting Shakespeare, the Bible, poetry by a good businessman. You sure he hasn't got some big investments, something like that, that went bad on him recently? I'm sure. There has to be some. No, get reason. back, I tell you. You gotta stay back in the line. You wanna keep your job, you tell your chief I'm here, and I wanna know why this fire got out of hand. Well, who's that? Now look, miss, I got orders. Don't choke on them! It's all right, Jerry, I'll take care of her. Whatever you say, Mr. Gibbons, but I got it's orders. Okay. Well, Miss Carson, it looks like you're losing another market. This is the fourth one. The fourth one and a little over a... Hey, don't I know you? I'm afraid I haven't had the pleasure. Miss Margaret Carson, this is Johnny Dollar. The insurance investigator. Good. Now maybe we'll get somewhere. Oh, this is... Walter. Walter! What? Uh, oh. <laughs> yes, Margaret? My fiancé, Mr. Dollar. Walter Smitten. Smitten? Hello, Walter. Mr. Gibbon? Walter handles the legal end of things for Dad. Oh, I see. Next president of the company, Walter? I? In the grocery business? Oh, no. No, sir, thank you. The legal end is enough for me. Well, what do you think about these fires? Four in a row. Well, if I were you, Mr. Dollar, I'd suspect arson. Oh, Walter, for heaven's sake. Why, Walter? Hmm? Someone trying to put Mr. Carson out of business, something like that. Put father out of business with a couple of fires? <laughs> Miss Carson... Come on, Walter, we've seen all we need to make the final report to Dad. Goodbye, Mr. Dollar. Carol? Yeah, uh, see ya. Like a motive, Johnny? That Walter character? If he marries Margaret Carson, then he doesn't seem to like the grocery business. Yeah, but if he could get the money from it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars. And behind each star, there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. South Dakota's state flag was inspired by a song. South Dakota is the sunshine state. A stenographer named Ida Anding designed the flag with a sky blue background and a blazing sun in the center. And the words, South Dakota, the sunshine state, in gold around the sun. Later, the state seal was inserted over the sun, a seal representing mining and agriculture, the prime pursuits of the state. The state's banner also carries the motto, Under God, the People Rule. South Dakota state flag, the flag of the 40th state to enter the Union, was adopted on March 8, 1909. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Carson Arson Matter. Expense account item three, 20 cents phone call from a booth near the scene of the fire. I wanted more information from Jim Paris at Worldwide Mutual. Information about the policies covering the 13 cash and save markets, four of which had recently gone up in flames. I waited in the phone booth until Jim called me back. Johnny Dollar. Jim here. Oh, good. All right, here's the list of markets, Johnny, in the order of insurance coverage, starting with the smallest amount. Go ahead. Thompsonville... Fall River, Lowell, Hartford. That's the same order in which they burn. Exactly. Okay. Which remaining store has the next biggest coverage? Salem. Okay, I'll start with Salem. What are you thinking of, Johnny? It's just a hunch, Jim, but... Well, I'll call you later. (laughs) Item four, five dollars and a quarter for a cab back to my apartment. Item five, twenty-one dollars even, mileage in my own car, Hartford to Salem, Mass., Despite burning up the highway, it was almost dark when I pulled into Salem. It was well after dark when I finally located the cash and save market. Again, the store was far outside of town, and it was a long way from the nearest firehouse. I don't know exactly why I went there instead of the main office in Boston. After all, it was the same day as the Hartford fire, and the others had all been about a week apart. As I said before, call it a hunch. But... As I pulled up in front of the place, I saw the shadow of a man dart furtively around the back of the building. As I reached the far corner of the building, I stopped. But with only the sliver of a crescent moon, I could see no one. Somewhere ahead of me, I heard a door open. Then silence again. But somebody had entered that building. Slowly... 
cautiously, I felt my way along the wall. And then I came to it. An open door. Storeroom. But inside it was pitch black. I drew my gun and carefully, quietly fell around for a light switch. After stumbling gently against a big packing case, I found it. I hunched down behind the case and flicked it on. All right, where are you? I heard you. I saw you come in here. Now, look, I got a gun, so don't try anything funny. You hear me? Where are you? Right huh? over your head! Oh! I must have been out a long time. I came to lying on a cot in the back room of Salem Police Headquarters. A couple of gallon jars. Of... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Well, it was a couple of big gallon jars of kosher pickles that he dropped on top of your head. He, officer? Well, I'd like to split your head open. So he brought you in here to headquarters and had the doc look you over. Up. Easy now. Oh, yes, sir. Well, doc says no permanent harm done. He'll give you a shot to make you sleep and rest. Now, how about this cup of hot coffee? Yeah, sure. And about a dozen aspirins. My head feels like... There you are. Thanks. But you, you said he. Well, according to him, you left yourself wide open when you sneaked in there after him. And then to turn on the lights. Son, you've got a lot to learn. Okay, so I pulled a bobo. But do you know who it was that slugged me? Of course, son. He brought you here. Who? Owner of the market. What? Mr. John Wakefield Carson. <laughs> Item six, two dollars more mileage on my car. This time down to Boston in the main office of Cash and Save Markets. To the private office of John Wakefield Carson. Please be calm of mind. All passion spent, Mr. Dollar. What? That's from Milton. Please sit down. <sighs> now look, Mr. Carson, about last night... Badoff plays tricks upon us all. It did so in bringing us together last night. How did you know I was going to investigate that market of yours up in Salem? Well, I didn't know. But look, you young man. Yeah? The fires which destroyed those four markets did so and order their value to me. So I found out. Well, possibly then the next to go would be the store in Salem. For that indeed is next in order of value. It figures. Or perhaps it was mere coincidence those accidents occurred in that order. Accidents? Remember, coincidence breeds further coincidence. That's a quotation from Brasco. Now listen to me, Mr. Carson. For so that reason, I decided to inspect the Salem store myself. Inspect it, huh? To make sure there'd be no possibility of spontaneous combustion there. Let's get one thing straight right now, Mr. Carson. Uh, yes? I think those fires were set. And if you'll come down to earth... Possible, I suppose. It was Shakespeare who said, Fire answers fire. Oh, for... Through their paley flames, each sees the other's umbered face. Listen to me, will you? Uh, oh, of course. I think you set those fires, or had them set. By Mr. Dollar. I think you were going to burn down the store in Salem until I came along. Oh, when I saw you there, I thought that was your intent. Oh, sure, sure. All right, tell me this. What do you plan to do with the insurance money, if you get it? Rebuild? Bigger and better stores where the old ones stood? Oh, no. Or did you find out you hadn't made them big and modern enough for those real estate developments where they were located? and decided the cheapest way for you no. to... No. No. To build again where tragic dealt the fate. Forget the fancy quotes and answer my question. Shakespeare said you tread upon my patience, sir. Look. It's most enough to make a deacon swear. That's by James Russell. Mr. Carson. What disposition of the funds I choose to make is mine alone to settle. And from my heart. Carson. Enough. I've had enough of this. Now be on your way. No, wait a minute. Be gone, Dollar. And irk me now no more. Now you wait. From your heart, you said. Now I have said enough. Henceforth, my lips are sealed. Okay, okay. But you know something? I think you've told me who might have set those fires. And if you'll answer me just one more question. No? Okay, we'll see. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Sometimes we may wonder why a football team doesn't quit playing and walk off the field when it finds itself 50 points behind with only a few minutes of play to go. 
What is that indomitable spirit that fills men with hope and keeps them going in spite of terrific odds? Keeps them going just to play the game according to the rules, just to get the job done as well as they know how. This kind of spirit pervaded the feelings of heavy bomber crews of the 9th Air Force on that day of glory, August 1st, 1943. The day of one of the most secretly planned surprise bombing missions of World War II. The day of the low-level attack on the Romanian oil refineries at Ploeste. More than 170 B-24 heavily loaded bombers took off in a swirl of red dust from Benghazi, Libya to bomb a highly defended priority target. The element of surprise in the low-level attack was to be one of their greatest weapons. But things went wrong from the start. Three planes exploded during takeoff operations. Eleven more aborted due to engine trouble. Of those that reached the target area, less than one-third returned to home base. The leaders of the mission encountered navigation difficulties and difficulty in identifying the specific targets. And due to the loss of that elemental hope, surprise, they also encountered devastating enemy firepower from flak and fighters. The mission was partially successful, but a horrifying experience. Five medals of honor were awarded to the heroes of the Ploeste raid for valorous action above and beyond the call of duty. At any time, the men would have been justified in turning back. But they had a code of conduct that made them want to see the unequal game through to the end. It was a job that had to be done. A charge of the light brigade in the air as they flew down the valley of death to glory. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Carson Arson Matter. <laughs> Expense account item 780 cents, phone call to Hal Gibbons and the arson squad back in Hartford. Yeah, Johnny, I finally found plenty in the remains of that fire. Then it was arson. By some rank amateur. That's why it was hard to spot. What do you mean? When a pro sets a blaze, we know what to look for. I see. Now, what about the other three fires? I called the boys in those cities immediately. Heard back from them this morning. Same story. All right. Have you checked on Walter, what's his name, the fiancé of Carson's daughter? You mean stepdaughter. Stepdaughter? I have, and that's what stops me. Alibis, huh? Perfect. Walter Smitten couldn't possibly have started those fires. I didn't think so. Huh? Now, that boy may call himself a lawyer, Hal, but he just hasn't the nerve, the gumption. But who else? He stands to benefit if he marries Margaret Carson. And surely you don't think Carson himself... Johnny? Call the Boston police, will you? Have them meet me at Carson's office. What for? Maybe to make an arrest. Do that for me, will you? Hunch? Maybe it was more than a hunch now. Sure, I know there was no real clues in the case, but maybe for once I could get along without them. I went back to Carson's office and, I must confess, tried a little bluff. Caught? You'd hail me into court? That's right. Unless you open up and tell me what I want to know. Very well. Speak to me as to thy thinkings, as thou dost... And you can forget the quotations. Walter Smitten is your lawyer, isn't he? A timid but an eager lad who saved me many a fall. You like him? Like a son. Why would he were my son? Or as the Bible says, a wise son maketh a happy... All right, all right. Uh, Oh, yes, yes. You have a stepdaughter, Margaret. Alas, I have. Okay. Now, who is to get the insurance money you may collect? Well, that, sir, is none of your concern. You're going to talk now, Mr. Carson, but or in court? it's a family matter. Who gets it? I... I pledged to my wife before she died that Margaret would have all monies from any profit, any monetary gain of any kind, of any of my ventures. That would include the insurance money. I see. That, Mr. Dollar, was my pledge, and oh, how I have rued it. Why do you say that? She's not of my blood, Mr. Dollar. She has no soul for art or poetry. And since she's come of age, she's made so many demands upon me. Money, money, money. That's all she thinks of. And unlike Walter, she's so bold, aggressive, headstrong. Were it not for Walter, I'd mistrust her every move. But if he's in love with her... Because she demands he be, and why... So she can use his legal guidance in her fight to take this business away from me. All right, Mr. Carson. I haven't notified the authorities yet, but I've found proof that Margaret is the one who started those fires. You what? And you've just told me why. Because the money would go to her. 
Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm glad. I've suspected, yes, but because of family honor. No, 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 I'm glad you have proof. Long last it will take her. Take this millstone from about my neck. Proof, Pop. Margaret. Well, Dollar, you'll never live to tell the authorities. Margaret, that, that gun. Unless you'd like to make a deal, Johnny. It could be worth a lot of money to you. I'd even promise not to set any more fires. Oh, you were right, Mr. Dollar. Unless I'm mistaken, Margaret, the man who just came in... What man? ...who heard your little confession is from the police department. Are you trying to make me look around so you can grab for this gun? Oh, no. Fact remains, he's standing right in back of you. <laughs> That's right, Margaret. What? No! No! Oh, my hand! My hand! Oh, my hand! How sharper than a serpent's tooth is an ungrateful child. Yeah, the company will have to pay on those four markets. And the courts will have to take care of market. I'm sure they will. And next time, well, give me something clean to work on, will you? I hate this kind of stuff. Expense account total, including the trip home, $56.90. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Oklahoma's state flag depicts an Osage warrior's circular buckskin shield from which hang seven eagle feathers. Across the shield is the Indian's calumet, or pipe of peace, crossed with a white man's peace symbol, the olive branch. On the shield are small crosses, the Indian's graphic sign for stars, indicating lofty ideals or a purpose for high endeavor. The background of the flag is a field of blue, the blue of the Oklahoma sky, signifying loyalty and devotion. The important symbols, however, are the calumet and the olive branch. These override the shield, the symbol of war, and bespeak a predominant love of peace by a united people. Oklahoma state flag, the flag of the 46th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 2nd, 1925. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the Rolling Stone matter. Remember that old saying about a Rolling Stone? Well, it applies here with a vengeance. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood and is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote today's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Byron Kane, Harry Bartell, Jack Edwards, Joe Kearns, and Forrest Lewis. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.